You're listening to an encore presentation of this program, KCAA, the Inland Talk Express. Welcome to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Each week on this program, Jeff and his guests share their expertise, personal anecdotes, and the latest industry news to keep you in the loop. Now to provide you with insight and help you navigate the consistently changing world of real estate lending, here is your host for The Mortgage Voice, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning in to listening to the show each and every week as we come to you bringing you information about mortgages, about real estate, about the state of the economy, about your feelings, whether you want to buy, whether you want to sell, or whether you're just too darn nervous about what's going on everywhere to do anything. And I I totally understand that. Again, I am Jeff Barton. This is The Mortgage Voice. If you want to see and hear this show each and every week, you can go to YouTube uh, on on YouTube, uh, Jeff Barton, the Mortgage Voice is my mortgage channel, which has been there for uh, a long, long time. Hundreds of shows, and you can kind of see a trend and how things progress from week to week, and the confusion both in this host and some of the guests that come on the show to try to tell you what's going on. It is not easy, especially when we're trying to decide between inflation and we're trying to decide between interest rates and we're trying to decide whether. Um, you know, this particular person or that particular person is is uh, uh, getting indicted or running for president, or it's just one of those times in uh, in the mortgage industry, uh, which is is difficult. And uh, I understand your pain, I feel your pain, but if you want to see how it progresses, go to YouTube, Jeff Hart and the Mortgage Voice. You can not only see me, hear me, but as I said, each and every week we're there. So click on that you like it, join the, join the club, join the show. I get, uh, I don't know, several people a week who do sign up. So it's, it's interesting how that whole process works too. I am not a internet person, nor am I uh, somebody who understands the ins and outs of TikTok, Twitter, or whatever they're calling it now. Of course, that sounds ridiculous. I know what they're calling it. They're calling it X. Uh, okay, let's lead off the show. Again, I'm Jeff Barton. This is the Mortgage Voice. X, let's talk about this first. So I get into a Twitter war, uh, X war, I don't know, a year ago about the purchase and sale to Elon Musk of Twitter. And it was at the time, uh, you know, something that he was going back and forth with, with that particular bid, that offer. And I think it was at one time $54 billion. They ended up being $43, $44 billion dollars. For it. it was a tremendous platform in its day uh, and one that uh, the former president made absolutely famous and popular with his continued use of the platform, um, so much so that when he got banned from the platform, he, he started his own, right? Truth Social. Everybody knows what that is. So we uh, see recently, last few days, last couple days, now, now Elon Musk is a very uh, influential figure in many different circles, and he's uh, an enigma to some, and he's a hero to others. To me, he is a, a person who is hard to identify and say, hey, he is this or he is that. But when it came to the sale of Twitter X to Elon Musk at $43 billion, I said at the time through Twitter. No, this was a terrible idea. This is awful. This is some kind of bad investment. How can something like this be worth $43 billion? This is a terrible mistake. Now, it wasn't Jeff Barton making these prognostications about what was going on in the business world, which obviously Elon Musk <laughs> knows quite a bit more about the macro in the business world. But in this particular instance, after researching it, reading, and then just looking at it saying, how could this be worth $43 billion or whatever it was, $54 a share, whatever it was that he sold. This week, he said, I might shut the whole thing down. That's what Elon Musk said about X, formerly Twitter. Think about that for a second. Now, you're driving around or you're listening to somehow, uh, whether it's on the Internet or whether it's through your car radio, as I said, driving around, figuring out how you're going to conquer 17% inflation over the last two years, right? That's, that's what it is. And these are some of the things that when people say, oh, inflation's down. No, it's not down. <laughs> what it is is it has stopped the forward progress to the rate that it was going. But if you think about food costs and energy costs and, you know, college tuition costs and all the things that make life, you know, why you got to go to work each day. 
it's difficult because things cost more now. But think about that. Guy who pays $54 billion says, I might just chuck the whole thing, right? I mean, who can do that? Obviously, Elon Musk can. I, again, uh, on the Elon Musk train right now, it is uh, uh, his Tesla car company. Um, Cybertruck is out finally. Uh, big gaps in the side panels aside, it looks to be uh, one of those moves that is going to push Tesla back above a trillion dollar um, company, a trillion dollar valuation. Think about that for a second. Now, there was a graph back in the day when we were thinking billion dollars, no one had ever heard of that number. Now we're throwing trillions around like, of course, it's an everyday thing, which it's not. But they did a, um, it would see what the difference between a million dollars, which was, you know, if you piled dollar bills on top of one another to the top of the Empire State Building. Again, I'm dating myself. For those of you who don't know, the Empire State Building is this big, tall building in New York City. It was, for the longest time, the most iconic, tall thing in the world. Now, of course, it's just a number of, and it's, you know. So the difference between dollar bills st stacked to the top of the Empire State Building and dollar bills stacked from Earth to the moon was, you know, the visual on the difference between a million dollars and a billion dollars. Well, a trillion dollars, I, I can't even imagine what I haven't seen the the graphic but it's it's a huge huge amount and here's a guy who's just chucking 54 billion like it's nothing maybe and saying hey I'm worth you know trillion dollars now with Tesla a guy that really has you know obviously has he knows what he's doing in certain aspects of what he's doing in his businesses I bring all that up because when we mere mortals talk about what's happening and how we're going to make decisions about, you know, what is the best decision I can make to purchase this house in this mortgage environment, this mortgage environment being actually not as bad as it has been. Uh, if we look at the 30-year at 7.09%, the 15 at 6.48, FHA is at 6.50%, the jumbo is ridiculous, 7.60, and the, the 5.1 is at 6.72. So these numbers off the high of 8.5% of a 30-year fixed really makes this quite a bit more feasible in terms of, you know, affordability, even though we still have lack of inventory and the price for your house keeps increasing. I, I read a def, definitely a couple of articles over the last couple of weeks that talked about we may see price reductions in X or we may see some uh, reduction in the amount you're going to have to pay to get that house, not only in the mortgage but also in the cost of the house. Well, may be reduction in price is really not a strategy to go out there and look for a house, right? You gotta know what the price is and you gotta know what you can afford. These are the main, main things in order to go house hunting. So we see houses uh, being sold out there at the lowest clip for, for a generation in terms of the number of houses sold. Now that's, that's because of the unaffordability in the mortgages and in the price of the home. Um, but as I said, Mortgage prices have come down. We have seen uh, some of mortgage uh, applications go up, the number of mortgage applications nationwide. But we're talking small percentages compared to the, the, the time when mortgages were a lot cheaper. Now, will we see mortgages dip? Will we see this kind of, you know, progress? Yes, it's possible. And, and in, in that, I wanted to give you an idea of what is, oh, we're wrapping up? Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Uh, we've, we've got a couple more segments to get to a lot of this stuff. Uh, we'll, see you, we'll see you right back. And again, thank you for joining the show and listening to us each and every week. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. 
Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show each and every week. The clock worked. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Anyway, this is <laughs> behind the scenes technical issues here at the show. Occasionally, it really makes things uh, very interesting. But uh, we got it up and running, so I'm very happy. Anyway, if you want to listen to the show each and every week, that's great. Uh, there's a bunch of places you can do it. You can certainly do it in our podcast. You can certainly do it on our website. That's themortgagevoice.com. You can do it on YouTube. Jeff Barton, the Mortgage Voice on YouTube. Do you have those? Um, uh, podcasting sites that they can go to, Daryl? Sure do, Jeff. It's uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Music Play, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Radio.com, YouTube, and Podclips.io. Okay. And MortgageVoice.com. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Podclips.io, great place to centralize all your podcasting needs. If you need more than just me to listen to each and every week, great place to listen. Great, a, a lot of different topics, uh, a lot of different great People who are on there who can podcast way better than me. Anyway, podclips.io, great place. Go to it. Find your podcasting needs. Again, I am Jeff Barton. This is The Mortgage Voice, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, with us now is uh, Julie Peisner. Now, Julie comes with, to us um, occasionally, about once, twice, a quarter, possibly, uh, and talks about what's happening up in the Bay Area, up in Central California in terms of real estate. Um, she's an experienced, uh, great realtor. Uh, for that area and we always like to go to it because San Francisco is kind of a, a focus for real estate of many reasons anyway Julie joins us now Julie how are you I'm well thank you okay that's uh, that sounds very ominous <laughs> <laughs> okay are you I have I have nothing to hide <laughs> I am well <laughs> okay excellent very good now the holidays are upon us you got a you got a growing or a big family and uh, how's that going to go for you this year it's you know what I I'm trying to get ahead of it. Mm -hmm. I am actually this year trying to plan out my holidays and not get overwhelmed, which uh, is a big feat in and of itself. But uh, we w we've got uh, three weeks before the kids get out of school, yep. and then uh, we're off to the mountains for a couple of weeks, and. Um, so yeah, we're yeah, we're planning still doing the end of the year kind of holiday madness and business planning and all that. So okay, good. Uh, you brought exciting. it up, business planning, great idea. Okay, so the city itself. Yeah. Now, first off, <clears throat> you work in two different areas and have since the pandemic broadened your your uh, reach in terms of your real estate expertise and what you do and how you service your clients. Um, could you just lay out for the people who are listening those particular areas and then I'll ask my question. Yeah, so I would say my main focus, I, I live for the most part full time in the beautiful poop free city of San Francisco. <laughs> I saw the map last <laughs> night. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Jeez. Right? As much as DeSantis wants to, you know, literally No, don't poo -poo say poo poo it. No, don't say that. No. <laughs> Uh, but I, so I, you know, I, I've lived in San Francisco for, gosh, going on, I think, 25 years right. um, or more. And I have been a realtor here for 20. Uh, I work for Sotheby's International Realty in San Francisco. My main focus is the city and slightly beyond that. Uh, but I do have an amazing referral network that spans the globe, really, which is, hmm kind of part of the reason why I moved over to the Sotheby's from a local boutique firm. Um, we own a home in North Tahoe, and so I sometimes do a little business there because we ended up spending much of the pandemic there as right. well. Um, and, and that market is a very interesting market, too, um, that has, you know, much like many other markets, has, you know, been affected by interest rates and whatnot. Um, because it's mostly a second home market, I think it's right. probably slowed down a little bit m more so than the city. Um, but that's kind of mostly what I do now. And I, I know that you and everyone else who's in real estate this past year has probably experienced much of the same kind of slow down sluggishness that we have. Yeah, um, we have. And and so, that, that's interesting. Let me let me just jump in there and say, hey, look, you know. We, we often look towards 
metropolitan areas in big states, big cities, uh, mm -hmm. to see what's happening, real estate everywhere. I mean, if real estate is good, then your economy is probably doing okay and the people are probably yeah. happy. But we haven't had that for a while. And one of the reasons San Francisco always is, is of, of interest to me because it nationally has always been the poster child for what's wrong with democratic cities in the U.S. And, and, and the feces problem and the homeless problem and the thefts yeah. and the thing. What is the yeah. real story about not only that, and I know real estate prices yeah. haven't come down either, so that tells you not, something about what's much. happening. No. Not much. No. Yeah. And, you know, of course, like a lot of the uh, – listen, I live in the city. So right. I, I do, like, you know, there is no denying that there are issues, but it, there are not issues that any other big metropolitan city is without. So, sure – we have a homeless problem. We have, you know, pro uh, drug problems, and but they're not as prevalent as most of, you know, the media, right. especially the, you know, Fox <laughs> News would like to think it is. I mean, uh -huh. there are, you know, and and I think because of the pandemic, and, and it's, you know, there are still areas all over the place that are still slow to return just because of the whole change in, you know, work from home, which has affected not only just, you know, the Bay Area, but many, many cities. Right. And so we're still, you know, kind of struggling with what to do with the office space and how you, you really can't convert it that easily, even though it would be great to convert it to, to, sure. uh, to home. But it's, sure. you know, not so simple as it looks. No, it's not. Um, but we do, I, I think that all of the AI buzz has really helped in terms of getting people back into the city, into offices. There's, there is an excitement around AI now that is bringing people back. And a lot of the, the fun neighborhoods are thriving again and people are out and about. And, you know, it's, it's not as depressing as, as, you know, a lot of people make it out to be we just had that huge apec conference here right, right. a couple of weeks ago and uh you know nobody was murdered so <laughs> <laughs> that's always a positive i think for business right? when people on the right? street yeah are still there when you yeah. when you need to yeah. see them well i agree with that in terms of both how things are presented and what people say about it uh san francisco real estate prices what is a hot market where is the market right now up there so here's the thing about the market, and I have had this conversation many times, especially with buyers, is for a while, I mean, we have seen interest rates tick up all year long, yep. and there has really been a, you know, just this impasse between sellers and buyers, where sellers don't want to sell if they right. don't need to, or, you know, because no one wants to get rid of their 2.85 yep. interest rates. We know that. Buyers are still thinking that prices are going to go down or that, you know, it will get worse. And the problem is it's not happening because there's just no inventory for them. Yep. And then when there is inventory, you'd be surprised that the good stuff still gets kind of bit up. And if you look at the, the median price, it really hasn't budged that much. It hasn't gone up like it had been over the past several years but it also hasn't really gone down so you right. know you're just so what i tell buyers in this market is if you can you know stomach a higher interest rate for the next year maybe you have leverage now like you can still negotiate you know and maybe it's not just price maybe it's other terms but now is really the time to negotiate when you have the leverage because once interest rates go down, even if they're still in the sixes, it will start to get competitive again, and then you lose your leverage. Right. <laughs> so, it, it, it is a frustrating know? thing. Now, you talked a little about negotiating. How are we going to negotiate commissions in the future with buyers, given well, the lawsuit that that's out there? and still a very new and hot topic. Um, I work for Sotheby's, which is the parent company is Anywhere Real Estate, who right. settled out of that case. Yes, they did. So. Yeah, bigly, bigly <laughs> right? as our ex-president used to say. Yes, they which did. Which is pretty funny because when, it, when, it, when, the, when the news first came out, we thought that settlement was just bonkers. Right. 
But, you know, then when you see what they are getting, you know, I mean, who knows what will end up. I mean, obviously it's going to go up for appeal, and it, it will take a long time. But um, as of right now, nothing has really changed. We are still required to be members of the San Francisco Association of Realtors, right. which is by default automatically a member of, of NAR. So nothing really has changed. Um, and, I, I, you know, I know that a lot of people are thinking like, oh, great, now we don't have to have, you know, we don't have to pay all this commission or, you know, buyers can go straight to the listing agent. The problem with that is what listing agent is going to, to take on, you know, both sides of a transaction for a low commission. It's, it's really difficult to do. You become, you, you get, you have to like go into a place of kind of neutrality, which doesn't help either party. You know, you can't fight for the seller when you're also representing the buyer. So um, it's, it's a very interesting topic. I think, you know, what we've talked about a lot in our office is, having buyer broker agreements more now than we used to and really um, educating the buyers on why you need a buyer's agent, you know, going to the listing agent may not actually be in your favor. I I think all that's true. I think the listing agent has to now go to bat for the buyer's agent in terms of their commission and explaining it. But I know most listing agents will just say, sure, I'll do it for uh, 4%. You know, right. I want the money because right. this is a greedy business, regardless of yeah. how we all paint ourselves as these angels through NAR or whatever the code of ethics is. It's just, yeah, it's a quagmire to me. Um, I agree. And I think it'll stuff out some, you know, people who think like, oh, real estate's such an easy, you know, business to get into and you can make tons of money. Right. <laughs> right. Know, like, no, the new generation. Yeah, right. Exactly. Listen, I'm up against it. Could you let people know how to get in touch with you? For someone who's excellent up there in the Bay Area and uh, obviously out in, um, what is it, South Tahoe? Is that what you said? North Tahoe. North, um, so of course, North, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Who wants to live in South Tahoe? No, <laughs> I'm not, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, if you could just let people know how they can get in touch with you, that'd be great. So the easiest way is to just text me. Great. 415 415- Eight two three zero eight two four. You can also just Google my name, Julie Peisner, and like a million things will come up. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, that's perfect. Julie, thank you very much. Always love talking to you. It's exciting, and we always run out of time. So thank you once I again know. for coming on the show. Next I know. time it has to be longer. I know. We get, we should do a podcast rather than the radio interview. That's <laughs> we really should. That'd yeah. be fun. Okay. Thanks, Julie. Thanks for coming on, and uh, happy holiday Thanks, to you. Right. You too. All right. Bye. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry, and we'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show, for listening to us today. Each and every week, we come to you uh, via the radio waves at KCAA and the Inland Empire and the IE. Our friends out there, we've been listening or have been listening to us for, I don't know, 10 years or so. And uh, if if we're helpful, I appreciate that. If we're entertaining, that's a plus. Uh, obviously, we try to bring useful information, but also uh, there's a lot to talk about, which really affects your mental state about how you want to do things. Uh, big decisions like, you know, you're buying a house, buying a car, you know, sending kids to college. Long-term or short-term financial commitments are Something that, you know, is going to occupy most families uh, for a good long time. So taking your time to be able to make those decisions really is important to your mental state of mind when you're approaching the situation. So I put together a list, and this this is by no means all-inclusive. It's by no means, you know, uh, the list, but it is a list. And the list itself is going to show you where I am in terms of facing the the marketplace today and and the confusing data that comes at us all the time well and i'm not even talking political data i'm just talking financial data people that you know i i I talked earlier in the show about elon musk and some of the things that he's done uh with x and uh, and how that's really just 
in opposition to what most people have to deal with every day, i.e., I can't write off $54 billion in an investment because I made a mistake. No, I'm thinking 17% inflation over the next two years. My eggs are now, you know, uh, 2 and $3 higher than they were two years ago. And how am I going to navigate that? Now, that's where most people who listen to the show are. So let, let's get to my list, just so you understand what I'm talking about, okay? The, the list is called Headlines of a Confused World. And maybe it's just confused me, but that's the way I've headlined it. Okay, this is a juxtaposition of, 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 of like... Some part of our economy will be like this, and then somebody else will say completely the opposite. So let's just get to it. Oil prices could shoot up to $100 a barrel, uh, disruption risks in 2024. What does that mean? Okay, so on the opposite to that, in the same, in the same day on a different website, which I have to cover quite a few in order to get headlines for the show, Fed to cut interest rates six times in 24. Oil futures are lower. Oil prices are down. OPEC production cuts. So which is it? Are oil prices going down or are they going to go up? So in the one article that says they're going to go up, it's because the world is going to fall to, you know, H-E double hockey sticks, and you're going to have to pay more because there's going to be less on the market, right? In the other one, the reason oil prices are going to go down is because the demand is down and that China's, you know, imploding economy based on their real estate issues and any number of other issues worldwide will cut demand. Therefore, prices will go down. Well, what are the prices for oil today? About 75 bucks a barrel, right? Has been as high as $97 this year and as low as 65. So we're kind of in the middle somewhere. All right. Here's another one. Powell throws cold water on rate cut talk. Jerome Powell met this week with um, the press and talked a little bit about what the Fed strategy was in terms of um, cutting rates or hiking rates. That's the short-term interest rates that has kept everybody on bated breath in terms of will we go into a recession, will we not go into a recession? Well, Powell says, no, we're going to keep rates the way they are. Okay? Now, um, we also see the recession is more imminent, and it says here the inflation is more stubborn, but at the same time, Bank of America comes out and says rate cut next year. Okay, rate cut next year, March. That's Jeremy Siegel. Jeremy Siegel is an economist that is followed uh, quite extensively. He says that we're going to have rate cuts. So we've got Powell saying that we're going to keep rates the way they are at the Fed, and we have these two economists at Bank of America and Jeremy Siegel saying, nope, we're going to have rate cuts next year. Well, which is it? You're at home trying to figure it all out, right? You read an article, and this is one thing about myopathy. You know what that means? That means you, you, you stick on a point, and that's the way it is because that's the only thing I know about. Uh, and there are many, many different people out there who are saying, look, you've got to broaden your horizons and read everything all over the place to get some kind of consensus. Kind of agree with that on the economic front because really the Fed – is fickle and i'll tell you that straight up we have been seeing higher for longer we've been seeing a we're going to cure inflation we currently got inflation running at what three three and a half percent uh it has been coming down it was as high as 9.22 percent a couple you know 18 months ago but where is inflation headed can we see prices go lower now don't get me started on that because i'm one of these people that said okay as soon as you fix the supply side problem the, as soon as you fix supply chain problems as soon as you get commodities back in line with what demand is you're not going to see restaurants lowering their prices you everybody out to a restaurant in the last two or three months yeah what used to be a hundred dollar dinner for two is now 150 dollar dinner for two why uh oh, prices uh Supply chains. Well, you know what? Supply chains have been fixed. Commodity prices have come down all over the world. I just said oil has come down significantly. But have we seen restaurant prices come down? No, because people are greedy. That's just the way it is. It's going to be such until somebody says, and we, we heard recently politicians start saying, hey, you know what? These things are fixed. Lower the price. And I'm one of these people that says, you know what? Lower the price. <laughs> you don't have to be that greedy. And it's not going to happen. So we are dealing with a juxtaposition. The one party says this, another party says that, and you're there trying to figure out, okay, 
we've got interest rates at six and a half percent on a 30-year fix. Now's the time to jump. Uh, however, the price of my house just went up six percent, which it did last year, by the way. 2023 saw home prices raise about six percent. So yes, it's confusing out there. You've got a lot of conflicting information. You've got a lot of things that are in the, the, the lane of confusion. Yeah, good, good way to say it. Anyway, I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, we'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show. I say that each and every segment, and I do mean it. I mean, this is a time of year where there's a lot of things going on in people's lives. Family time is stress time. Let's just lay it out like that. If you've got older kids or you've got you're raising kids, to add additional stress of I got to do this, I got this one, I got I got cards to write, cookies to buy, food to make, presents to wrap. Oh man, it's it's a whole thing, and uh, and it doesn't really matter what your religious persuasion is. Everybody is sucked into it, and uh, if you're if you're like that, I get it, and. Um, Hopefully this show today especially can bring a little uh, information that you might be able to use in your decision-making process, which is going to come up probably in January. Good time to start looking for a house. I know December everyone says, oh, you can get those bargains, but there's really no bargain anymore in the real estate world. There's just not enough houses out there to, to buy. Uh, to bring some clarity to the mortgage side of the business is Charles Giscombe, who's been to this show uh, as the, our uh, local expert for years, uh, he does business all over the country, and he works for United Wholesale Financial. I, or is it United Wholesale? No, it's United Security Financial. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Out in Utah, and uh, he joins us now. Charles, thanks very much for joining us. Jeff, thanks for having me. Appreciate being out here as always. No, oh, thank you very much. Okay, we've got a um, uh, ever-changing mortgage market. Rates have come down a little bit, which is pretty good. We've seen some uh, mortgage application go up last week obviously when the when the rates come down people want to jump in before it's too late how are you seeing things and uh, where, what, what do you see as the uh, the end result uh, in the next 30 60 days as to where we're going on the low end of the mortgage rates absolutely Jeff uh, I see you know everybody's getting excited I see yeah. a little bit of a buzz for the interest rates going down yeah um, the funny thing is that, you know, everybody says, oh, they're really going to go down to the bottom. Well, no, hold your horses. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I do know what you're saying. I agree. <laughs> hold your horses. You know, at the end of the day, I tell everybody um, when there is, some, you know, societal extreme situations that occur, like elections and different stuff, that's when you're going to really see exactly what we're going to do. But right now, it's a interesting and a, a much welcome little boost uh, to show that the interest rates have gone down, so you have peaking some more interest in individuals. Um, a lot of people will jump in, um, and a lot of people will sit still and say, hey, let's see what it really does. Is it really going to go back down? So I, I'm seeing some more action uh, in the business, uh, but I also see a little bit of hesitancy because people are just waiting to see if we're going to stay here, go down, or if we're going to spike back up. You know, I always try to tell people, look, just – it." you know, quarter point here and there is really not going to make a big difference. But like like you just said, whether it's real estate prices or the mortgage rate, people just are hesitant and they don't yeah. want to make the jump when we all know that real estate's the, the name of the game in, in most markets. If you get in at the, you know, at a reasonable price that you're not looking to get in at the best price. I think Charles Munger, who just died recent, recently, which I, I don't know, you Berkshire Hathaway fan or not, but it was interesting because he said he, he uh, when, um, what's his name, Warren Buffett was talking about him, he said, Charles turned me around when he said, look, I used to look for these bargain prices and get in there and get the best price. And Munger said, no, 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 what you want to do is find value in what you're buying at a reasonable price. And I think Absolutely. that really applies in the real estate market right now. Jeff, I am 100% 100 with that. I completely believe in that. Value, that's the key. Mm -hmm. There's no magic tricks or there's no mystical, magical interest rates that are going to pop out of the sky. Nothing's <laughs> going to change right away the next day you wake up and now all of a sudden um, it's different. And now the, No, what you have to do is you have to think, what am I buying? What value does it have and will it hold? If it will increase, obviously we're happy. 
The worst case scenario, you hold your value. That's the most important thing. And in regards to interest rates and what we're doing right now, let's understand that we are on a, a revolving wheel. It will cycle around. It will get back. So that's why I say that value piece is super important, Jeff, and I 100% agree with the statement that he made. Yeah, and I, I think in, in real estate, let's, let's just talk residential real estate, right? You're going to live in the house. You're not looking to make money on it right now. So you're building wealth in the house, and you said it. Holding value is 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 very important because that becomes either your legacy that you leave or your nest egg for your retirement in your future. And I'm paying it off it. on a monthly is how you got to look at it. Jeff, you know what I say. You know, the big wins, there's big losses. But money saved is money earned. Right. And at the end of the day, if we're getting real estate and we're buying valuable pieces, like Jeff said, for legacy, for long term, that is the name of the game. Yeah, that no, is the I, name of the game. I, I really like that. No, so I've called this era right now where we see lowering um, interest rates, kind of the um, mid-season tournament uh, for the mortgage market, you know? I like it. We, you know, people are now hyped up again. They're like, oh, man, it was eight and a half. Now we're back down in the, in the low sevens for 30-year fixed. I'm like, yeah, that's right. This is, this is our in-season tournament. And uh, I, I do think that we will see in election year, you're going to see you know, rates settle down, and I read yesterday where they'd probably be in the 6 to 7% range, which is, which is a reasonable way to look at, I think, where the markets are headed. As long as we can get some um, inventory out there. Uh, wh where are you seeing your pockets of, uh, of not only inventory, but, you know, wh where is the, I guess, the mortgage market product and what are you selling out there? Is it still the non-QM? Are people now drifting more towards FHA? What do you see? You know what, Jeff? It's a mixture of a lot. Okay. You know, uh, one thing that we have to, you know, when we talk about with mortgages is demystifying this situation with our clients. Mortgage, a traditional mortgage is based on structure and what you can prove. At the end of the day, if you can prove, prove and provide that you have the ability to repay, you can qualify for a mortgage. Okay. At the end of the day, FHA, uh, the government loans will be a little bit lower in the interest rate. Obviously, the criteria to qualify for FHA is a little bit more flexible than it is for traditional Fannie Freddie. Okay. But what I see is is the non-QM market taking more and more real estate, uh, so to speak, um, away from these other traditional mortgages because they have the most flexible and lenient guidelines for people to qualify. I feel like that is the wave now, and it will be more and more as time goes on, because now um, individuals are now uh, self-employed or, or uh, staying at home and working as entrepreneurs, and they can show that they're getting income. They just may not be able to show their tax returns because in business, in taxes, you write things off and your income's not going to be as high. At the end of the day, if you don't have to provide that documentation, still get yourself into a decent interest rate loan, and now you're in there, there's other different things that these non-QM loans can do that the traditional mortgages can't do to offset the interest rates that we were, we're not normally used to. Six and seven is going to be great, but you might pay an 8% interest rate in a non-QM loan now that the rates have gone, up, uh, gone down. But at least you can do things like a 40-year loan, Jeff. Right. which will take you through an additional 120 months on a term that will lower that payment to get you into that 5 or 6% uh, check writing range that you've been used to uh, from the previous all-time low years. Nothing is going to be all-time low again, but the reality of it is if these mortgage rates are going to consistently come down a little bit, so does the non-QM rate. And that means you're going to lower yourself with less, with, with less strict, uh, uh, at least a less strict guideline or requirement and you can qualify for more house with no mortgage insurance. A lot of these non-QM loans, Jeff, can go up to 90% LTV with no mortgage insurance. You can't get that on any traditional loan. Right. And an FHA loan has to have mortgage insurance at all times. So these are just different things that you can do to get yourself into, to take advantage of what's going on. Rates high, rates getting lower. Still, non-QM qualification is a product out there that can compete with the traditional uh, and the, uh, the the government loans. Uh, obviously, the LTVs are higher with those traditional mortgages, but guess what? You have to provide a lot more documentation. 
Hey, I appreciate that, and, and I agree with you. I like the non-QM, and I like it as a filler for loans that you might not necessarily be able to get in the conventional or the govy type loans. Uh, it's just, it fills a need, and uh, most people say, hey, is this like, uh, you know, the old days? I said, no, this is not like, these are really legit loans. And all of these usually carry with them credit scores, you know, above 680, 700 most of them. So Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, listen, we're up uh, against it. Shout out your phone number. Let people know how they can get in touch with you. Uh, one of the one of the great loan officers out there. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Sure. Hey, you can reach me at that good uh, Las Vegas seven zero two three two eight five one nine one again seven zero two three two eight five one nine one. Uh, if you want to email me, you can e email me at cgiscombe at usfwholesale.net. Again, that's cgiscombe at usfwholesale.net. Excellent, Charles. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Always appreciate it. You're the best. Jeff, thanks for having me always, man. Sure, excellent. That's Charles Giscombe from USF, United Security Financial. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show, listening to us on a weekly basis. Each and every week, we come to you through KCAA, and that's our tower, our station, our, our shining light on the hill, as Reagan used to say. Uh, and I really appreciate the efforts that they put together for us, Fred and Mark and all the people down there. Thank you very much. They bring us to you in the IE, in the San Bernardino, Riverside area. Certainly, we reach out to Palm Springs, uh, some Indio up 15, down the 15, out the 10, uh, some parts of L.A. and uh, Orange Counties as well. We have a pretty broad and wide audience, and again, they're very um, appreciative, and, and the audience always grows, uh, as is evidenced by my online presence, which is either YouTube or the podcast that we have or our our uh, website, which is themortgagevoice.com. Anyway, I'm Jeff Barton. This is The Mortgage Voice. We talk a lot about the different types of uh, loan products, um, whether it be non-QM or traditional government loans, uh, hard money. There are a lot of different ways that you can go. Some of the things that we need to do more of is to describe what exactly the uh, the criteria is and why when we talk about hey lending is getting tighter what what do we actually mean uh does that mean that you know there's less money does that mean that credit score requirements have gone up uh, so i wanted to get into that uh today on this particular segment just so there's a nuts and bolts approach to your particular search for either a lender or a product or at least knowledgeable enough to be able to talk to somebody about what is required, why it's required. Well, maybe not why it's required. I mean, sometimes we're not quite sure why these things are required in that there are many different ways by which a uh, underwriter looks at a file. And uh, there are many different ways by which a company borrows money and lends it to you and uh, the requirements on them to do that. So there are more than just you and your profile uh, when we're talking about loans and why loans are given or why they're not given. Uh, so let, let's go through a couple of this, right? Let's talk about uh, the, the main person who looks at your file and decides we're going to lend this person money or we're not going to lend this person money. And that's, of course, the mortgage underwriter. Everybody knows that particular name. And when you see it on the, uh, the HUD or what they call the C CD, uh, the closing document, it's the underwriting fee, and it's usually around 1000 bucks, maybe a little bit more depending on whether it's a FHA, whether it's a Govy, whether it's a 30-year uh, fixed, or whether it's, uh, you know, a non-QM product. And that fee can be anywhere from 1000 to 1500 depending. Okay, so the mortgage underwriter, what are they, what are they looking at? Well, they're, they're looking at your credit. They're looking at the, uh, the finances. They're looking at the appraisal, and they're looking at making a decision based on that. So in, in breaking this down, it sounds, well, that doesn't sound too bad, but there's so many different elements that go into your credit. What, what are they looking at? Okay, so you know about your credit report, the three credit reporting agencies that deliver to your lender or the person making the credit decision on you, uh, the three main credit report uh, bureaus giving your FICO score. 
and everybody says, what's your FICO score? I, uh, my FICO score has got to be X and Y. Well, sometimes that is not the determining factor for credit. It just isn't. Uh, a lot of times this revolving credit, a lot of times uh, uh, medical bills that have brought your credit down, uh, sometimes there's uh, payments of sorts to different, like your student loan debt. A lot of these things don't factor in to your um, credit decision on getting a loan, but they may factor into your credit score. So your credit score itself has components to it that really you need to go over with your mortgage um, broker, your mortgage banker, the person you're talking to, your lender. Uh, they're the people that are going to help you develop a credit, what they call a credit profile. And that profile is usually based on 18 to 24 months of payments. The last 18 to 24 months of payments, not the previous 19 years, no, just the immediate credit parameters around when this credit decision is going to be made, which as I said is 18 to 24 months, and where you've been in your payment history on those things, and you minus out things like your student loan, and you minus out things like medical bills, or uh, medical bankruptcies, or, or other things like that. So it's interesting, but anyway, that's one of the things they, and then they examine your finances. This may be the most important part uh, for me. Uh, your credit, you have to build over time, so that's something you can take care of. But the, how you present yourself to the underwriter, what does that mean? I, you know, I have a job, here's my pay. I, I have bills, here are my bills. I have some investments, here's my investments. I have some savings, here's my savings. And here's, you know, that's it. I get these things. Well, depending on that way that you go, you're about ready to get a loan. You want to be able to get the best rate possible in that loan because the lower the rate the more money you can spend on the house or the more money you can spend on the payment that's very important so your credit score is important for the uh the score and also your finances are important if you are somebody who is making a ton of dough making quarter million dollars a year but you're spending three hundred thousand dollars a year and that is all part of the write-off so you don't have to show income well, that, that's not good for your financial condition. You have to have an understanding well before you get in front of the mortgage, um, the underwriter, as to what you're trying to present to them. You want to make sure that you're presenting to them not only the good credit scores we talked about, but a financial condition that says, hey, I'm doing well. I have a certain amount of money that I'm paying towards my bills, but this larger amount of money I'm able to, to save. And however I do my savings, whether it's through your tax-free, tax-exempt type savings, the Roth IRA or a straightforward IRA, whether you have money given to you by your employer in some kind of profit sharing or some kind of uh, long-term retirement account, how you're fixed in terms of your investments, whether you're investing in real estate, whether you're investing in the stock market, whether you're investing in something that you know is both conservative but yielding a return that every year you can say, this is what I'm going to make. Because you got this loan that you're going to have for 30 years, right? Even though everybody knows nobody holds on to a loan for 30 years, the bank looks at it like, okay, can you pay this for 30 years? And that's an important consideration when you're looking at how you set yourself up. So you got to come to the mortgage underwriter with this all figured out. Now, how are you going to figure that out? I would say a good six, eight months, nine months, maybe even a year before you decide to get into the market, you got to set yourself up for the best financial condition that you're going to present to the mortgage underwriter. Now, if it sounds like it's a job in and of itself doing a couple of these things, you're right, it is. But if you're considering about the amount of investment you're going to be making in this end result, your house, it's extremely important. Because after 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to have a huge amount of equity lined up in this house. So it really, really benefits you to prepare yourself for the best possible presentation to that mortgage underwriter. And the appraisal, of course, well, you can't do anything about that. This is hands hands off and arm's length. This is how appraisals are done. They're ordered by your particular um, lender, and that lender has to go through a, a number of processes, so they're not involved in 
the decision making processes as well. So those, these three things are ultimately the way that the mortgage underwriter is going to make uh, their decision. Uh, there are some things that you can do. We talked a little bit about that, but obviously get, getting pre-approved is important part of the, the process to purchase. Income asset verification, you want to be able to make sure that that's all done prior to uh, the appraisal. You can't do anything about but you can ask if the seller had done in the previous appraisal. Uh, the title search, important, obviously. You want to make sure that your title is, uh, that you own the property outright when you purchase it, and that's all part of your title search. And then the decision, uh, it's either approved or it's denied, and if it's denied, they're going to give you a reason why. Uh, and that's called a denial letter, and that has to come out to you within, uh, I think it's 90 days uh, after the decision is made. It may be less. Ask your lender when it comes to that. There are a number of documents, your W-2s, uh, your two-year employment, your taxes, your pay stubs, your account information, your child support, alimony, overtime, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and again, uh, get your credit in shape. Anyway, this is my overview of what the underwriting process is and looks for. I hope it was helpful. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. We will see you next time. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. For more on today's topic, visit www.malibufunding.net. We can't be everything to everyone, or can we? The station.